Lord, we thank you for your kindness to bring us here together to have uh, this space. Thank you for the Kirk of the Hills, this church that has hosted us so graciously for over 35 years, our class. And Father, we thank you for the work that you have done in and through your people through the reading of your word uh, through those years. And we ask, Lord, as we have gathered tonight to come and look into your word and discuss it and to wrestle with the parts of it that are hard, uh, we pray that we would not seek you in vain, that you would show up, that you would open our eyes to see things we have not seen before, that you would soften our hearts, that we might love you more, and that you might transform our lives, Lord, so that we would be different. We wouldn't leave here being the same. We pray that we would glorify Jesus, not only in our listening tonight and being here tonight, but that uh, we would learn things and act and be transformed so that we could be your willing servants and representatives of Jesus in the places where you have us. And so we pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. So let me get situated here. Okay. Um, Okay. So I woke up Christmas Eve morning. The power was out. Do you remember... This Christmas Eve, it was super cold. Uh, My family and I were actually in Nashville in a hotel. Uh, We had tried to drive to Alabama where my brother lived and we just got too tired. And so we had to stop in Nashville. And I don't know why, but this is where we stopped at a hotel, uh, like literally right across from the Tennessee Titans football stadium. Like we could look out of our room and see the parking lot and the, you know, the stadium and the power's out. And, you know, I wake up and I'm, I'm thinking about coffee immediately. (laughs) And so I'm like, ah, what's this going to be like? And so I'm like, okay, you know, we just got to get going, get on the road. And, um, you know, uh, turns out that was, uh, the power came back on. They did these rolling blackouts sorts of things. Um, as we were, the Tennessee Valley just, you know, would turn off the power uh, in different places for half an hour every, you know, couple hours. And uh, I'd never been a part of anything like that. And that was interesting. But as we were kind of gathering things up, we went downstairs and, okay, they didn't have breakfast because, you know, the power had been out and they weren't able to prepare. And, ah, no coffee. Ah. Um, but there were tons of people. I mean, this is Christmas Eve. And I would think kind of a, like a not very exciting place to be necessarily. Like, down, I mean, Nashville's great, but you know, I mean, like, I'm not a Tennessee Titans fan, as will become obvious to you. Not that I have anything against them necessarily, but there were tons of people. And as we were packing up, looked out our window, and the parking lot is starting to fill up. It is single digits, people, and tailgaters are coming with the Tennessee Titans van, with the, you know, the logo on it. They're getting out their Tennessee Titans tent. They've got their Tennessee Titans hat. They've got their Tennessee Titans cornhole. And if I didn't know better, I would have thought, you know, it's a balmy, you know, maybe 50 degrees, whatever, and it's going to warm up. Like it was single digits. And that, that image, um, stuck with me. And especially as I was thinking about this passage and, you know, so much material and trying to wrestle through, um, you know, but as I was looking out, I, I did think like, maybe I've missed out like some FOMO, like this is, seems super fun. Like it must be really good if these people are doing this and, you know, and so enthusiastically. And so I wonder what does your life say has value like that? What captures your attention? What do you like to talk about? What do you daydream about? What do you spend money on? What do you make sacrifices for? What do you order your calendar around? What do you love? What do you love like a, on Christmas Eve morning in single digits playing cornhole kind of love? What do you love? 
I suggest to you that we are made to love and to serve, and we can't stop loving. We can redirect our loves to different things or different people, but we can't stop loving and we can't stop serving. We can redirect our service, uh, whom or what we serve, but we can't stop serving. There's many interesting and valuable things in the world. And I wonder what does your life say has the greatest value? What does somebody look at your life and say, wow, I guess I'm, maybe I'm missing out. (laughs) I didn't know it could be like that. Um, Whom do you love? Whom do you serve? And as you think about like where you are right now, what is your heart desire? If you think, say like, if I had more of this in my life, I would have more purpose. I would have more value. I would have more joy. If I could, if my body looked like this, if my friends looked like that, if I, my car looked like that. What do you love, friends? Um, it's easier, I think, to see in somebody else and it's harder to see in ourselves. And that, I think, is one way our passages tonight, Second Kings chapters 15 and 20, offer us help. We can see others' loves and their service and we can learn from them. Um, of course, these chapters have some hard topics. And those of you who got a chance to read the passages through the week or work on the lesson have probably come up, bumped up against some of those things. Some things that uh, initially seem hard to relate to. The Israelites sustained and stubborn interest in worshiping idols. That just seems kind of weird to us, right? It seems weird to me. I'll be just transparent. Um, And God's strong reaction to it both their worshiping idols and their turning to other kings seem to matter immensely to him. And we may think, one, what's the big deal, God? I mean, seriously, in in one sense, like the Bible teaches us, idols are nothing. There's nothing behind them. They're just wood and iron or, or whatever, metal. And yet, at the same time, they mean it symbolizes more. It's, it's a love. And um, we might think just, oh, how silly these people were to worship idols, duh. Um, and yet, how often do we love less important things too much and more important things not as much as they need to be loved? Our loves, I suggest to you, need reshaping and reordering in order for us to flourish. God made us for love, but we cannot flourish unless God is our first love. He made us that way. He knows this and is fighting for our hearts. He is actively throughout history, the Bible testifies to this, calling people back to him. And for those of us who are in Christ, we... Think, I think we can learn from this passage that God is actively rewiring us to love him rightly. God is actively rewiring us, your heart and mine, if you are a follower of Christ, to love him rightly and more. Um, and okay, we're gonna tonight, that's sort of my opening transition. We're gonna cover about a century of Israelite history. I think it, I didn't add it up. And the numbers in Kings are a little bit um, challenging anyway. Uh, This is a lot of material. And so now we're going to be staying super high level, which is kind of frustrating to me because I love getting into the, you know, the nitty gritty. But we're going to look at the broader contours of the story. We're going to try to. So (laughs) call me back if I I try to get in too deep. So, and just like a heads up. So here's the outline we're going to, I'm going to talk through. Um, 2 Kings 15 to 20, we'll look at the first three chapters, chapter 15, 16, and 17, to see that persistent rebellion provokes God's judgment. Persistent rebellion provokes God's judgment. And then in chapters 18, 19, and 20, humble trust is proved by God's deliverance. Humble trust is proved right or true or sure by God's deliverance. So that's where we're going. And just 
We had other chapters in our lesson and that I'm hoping that you're going to get to talk about a little bit in your groups of Chronicles. It was just too much material to cover. So we're just going to look at Kings, particularly as we're looking at the story. We're closing the chapter in a way on the Northern kingdom of Israel, this lesson and Chronicles material focuses almost exclusively on Judah. And so that's why we're going to look at Kings. So, and I love Kings. It's my favorite book. So there we go. Um, all right. So we're entering the movie like three quarters of the way through. So if you're ten- new here tonight, I apologize because we're going to be jumping in uh, to a story that is well on its way. Um, this is a story of two kingdoms, both who are part of God's covenant people, the Northern kingdom who has been characterized widely by rejecting God, persistently, stubbornly. And we're also going to be learning about the southern kingdom, Judah, who is saltier. There's less spiritual decay, but still in decline. So I tried my hand at a little cartography over there. You can probably see why I'm not a map maker normally in my day job, but Um, that's probably actually not, I mean, of course it's not drawn to scale, but you can see Assyria is way up in the north. Um, and they dominated at this time in the 700 BC timeframe, um, all the area that sort of dashed in the red lines. So Assyria is a big deal. And Samaria, I'm sorry, Samaria slash Israel slash the Northern kingdom and Judah, I probably drew those too big. They are little, little tiny kingdoms and sort of in the mid pathway. If you're going to, if you're a superpower of Syria and then you have in your sights, another superpower, Egypt, like you are barreling right on through But God brought his people and planted in this land. It's a thoroughfare. He wanted his people to be a light to the nations and they were not doing that largely. So uh, God is still going to, uh, God is still going to accomplish his purposes. All right. So let's dig in, open your Bibles or turn them on, power them up to second Kings 15 to 17. And we're going to look at this first section, flagrant rebellion provokes the Lord's judgment. So these three chapters, 15, 16, and 17 has basically two parts with an epilogue. And so the Northern kingdom uh, the northern, that's what I have, Israel in, in uh, scare quotes, is uh, the focus there, uh, even though Judah is part of that. The first part of these chapters, you can just see if you scan fifth, chapter 15 and chapter 16 and the first part of chapter 17, we have nine kingly snapshots all laid out for us in pretty much similar ways. And so I suggest to you that encourages our comparison uh, and contrast of these. Israel has six kings, all whom are bad. Judah has uh, two kings, good kings, they weren't perfect. And then one horribly evil king, Ahaz, who gets his own chapter, chapter 16. And so Ahaz really sets up the contrast for what will come in chapters 18 to 20. Ahaz is the dad and Hezekiah is the son. So we see some generational um, breaking free of a generational pattern, right, in there. So um, so as we read through these, two quick points. One, they seem carefully arranged. There's five kings in the Israel. Um, The middle one, Madaham, seems, I probably pronounced that wrong, seems the worst between two kings of Judah. So you have a, an Israel, bad king of Israel sandwich. You've got a good king, five kings. The middle one is real a doozy. And then a good king. And then we have, it reverses sort of Judah, who is horrible, that horrible king. And then, um, and then Hosea, the last king of Israel, who is, doesn't seem too bad, but that doesn't stop um, the judgment from coming. And so as you look at these uh, yourself and in your personal study. We don't have time to do this, but I suggest when you look at these sorts of kings, um, ask three questions. What or whom do they love? What or whom do they love? What or whom do they serve? 
And then number three, what could this king have done to lean into God's compassion? What could this king have done to lean into God's compassion? So those are three questions to kind of take on your own. Okay, four observations in this section. Um, Number one, we are repeatedly reminded that God is watching. So if every of those nine kings but one, there is a refrain. So if we look at 15, uh, three, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Uh, Zechariah 15, nine, and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Um, And then, uh, where does Manach? Shalom doesn't get a notice there. Um, 15, 18, and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Um, Shalom only reigned for a month and what he did (laughs) seemed really bad anyway. So he was probably, we're supposed to hear that, that he didn't do what was right in the eyes of the Lord either. So we're repeatedly reminded that God is watching. Our deeds and our hearts are evaluated from his view. He's the king. Um, Second, persistent rejection of God correlates with increasing violence and immorality. So we see this in the bad kings, especially. Those, the five kings all together, wow, they are really bad. They're killing each other and like ripping pregnant women open. I mean, it's like really, really bad, horrible stuff. And these are just the little excerpts. Um, And so the only glimmer of goodness is Hosea, who says in 17.2, it's uh, the narrator tells us, um, that he didn't, he wasn't as bad, not, not as evil as the kings of Israel who were before him. But still, every king in the Israel did, uh, in, did evil in the eyes of the Lord and sinned as Jeroboam the first did by setting up idols that the people would worship um, in the northern kingdom so they wouldn't go down to Jerusalem. That uh, caused the people to sin. Um, and so the northern Israel is on a steep downhill of internal violence and wickedness. Okay, third observation of four. God is active even when we cannot see it. He makes sure that his word comes to pass. We see that in chapter 15, 12. Um, the Lord's promise that he made to Jehu that his, uh, that his heirs would be on the, on the throne for four generations. There's also a promise that God remembers what he has promised. So way back, if you look at 1 Kings chapter 14, 15, this was a promise that the Lord made to Jeroboam, the first wife, and said, Israel will be scattered because of this sin. And so we're, we're seeing that now. God, is, not only does he make sure his word comes to pass, he remembers the things that, you know, the characters in the text probably don't actually remember him saying this. Um, and yet God delays judgment out of his compassion. Uh, look back just a few verses before the start of chapter 15, 2 Kings 14, 26 to 27. Uh, for the Lord saw that the affliction of Israel was very bitter, for there was none left, bond or free, and there was none to help Israel. But the Lord had not said that he, had blot, that he would blot the nation name of Israel up from the heaven, under heaven. So he saved them by the hand of Jeroboam, the son of Joash. That's Jeroboam the second. But anyway, you see his compassion. He is keeping his word, delaying his judgment because of his compassion. He's also acting in ways to indicate his discipline. He does, there's specific notes in the two Judah good kings, uh, 15.5, in 1537, so 155, uh, the Lord touched the king so that he was a leper to the day of his death. In 1537, uh, I think it says, in that day, let me find it. In those days, the Lord began to send Rezin, the king of Syria. You can see their next door neighbor to the north. Um, and Pekah, the son of Ramalia, against Judah. Pekah was a, a Israelite king at the time in Israel, the northern uh, kingdom. And so um, we see God is disciplining. Um, the Bible in Hebrews tells us, Hebrews twelve five to 7, God disciplines those whom he loves. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. And so 
um, God is still acting in the lives of good kings who need discipline. Wicked kings, notice, don't get that same comment. Not that God wasn't active, but there seems to come a time when God turns people over to their own sin, like in Romans one twenty four, And sometimes sin is its own punishment. And so God is acting in the background and he's drawing this world superpower, Assyria, nearer. And we see that increasingly over the count of those kings. And uh, that happened. Uh, and it gave Israel more opportunities to turn back to God as the, you know, Paul and uh, Shalmaneser, like they, there were other op- uh, opportunities for, the, for Israel, the northern kingdom, to say, oh no, Assyria is coming to wipe us out. Let us turn to the Lord. Um, and we can see this isn't explicitly in this text, but if you look ahead in Second Kings 19, verse 25, um, he talks about, um, this is the uh, pro- prophetic prophecy, um, that poetic prophecy from the Lord gave to Isaiah. Have you not heard that I determined it? The eye is the Lord here. Long ago, I planned from days of old what I now bring to pass, that you should turn fortified cities into heaps of ruins, while their inhabitants, shorn of strength, are dismayed and confounded and have become like plants of the field and like tender grass, like grass on the housetops blighted before it is grown. So the Lord is acting. Um, Last uh, observation from these chapter or from this section Um, Number four, it seems that God is giving opportunities to watch others and learn from example. So even though the the kings are interspersed um, in these different different kingdoms, um, of them, Ahaz of Judah in chapter 16 is truly terrible. Everything that he does is recorded is the absolute opposite of what he should have done. And um, we can wonder, why is Ahaz not judged? The very next thing that happens is that Hosea is judged, the last king of Israel, who evidently wasn't as bad as the others. Perhaps God allowed Israel that one last opportunity to see how ugly unfaithfulness is in hopes that they might come to their senses. And um, similarly, as Assyria increasingly threatens tiny northern Israel, Judah should be able to see what the fruit of persistent disloyalty to God is going to reap. Um, okay, the last word in this section of the nine kings is a serious conquering of Israel. And so um, that's the chapter 17, uh, verse 3. <clears throat> Against him, Hosea, the last king of Israel, came up Shalmaneser, king of Assyria. And Hosea became his vassal and paid him tribute. But the king of Israel found treachery in Hosea. For he had sent messengers to So, king of Egypt, and offered no tribute to the king of Assyria, as he had done year by year. Therefore the king of Assyria shut him up and bound him in prison. Then the king of Assyria invaded all the land and came to Samaria, and for three years he besieged it. Verse 6, in the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria, and he carried the Israelites away to Assyria and placed them in Hala. And on the Habor, the river of Ganzan, and the cities of the Medes. So they're taken out of the land. Um, and that was evidently Assyria's policy that they had typically, when Assyria would come in and take over a territory, they would deport and displace the people, the inhabitants of that, of that region, and put them somewhere else. And so the, uh, we see that, ironically, <laughs> Shalmaneser destroyed Israel because he found Hosea to be unfaithful and divided his allegiance. And yet God was punishing Israel for that same thing, which, um, and those 10 tribes of Israel were taken into captivity. The Bible has little record of their continued existence, but there are glimmers. For example, Anna in Luke two is from the tribe of Asher. So, uh, and remember, in way back in 1 Kings 8, uh, when Solomon is dedicating the temple and he prays seven scenarios, if your people do this, please hear. And one of the, the last, the seventh scenario exactly is this. Um, God's people taken into captivity and he asked the Lord to have mercy on the, re- on the repentant. And so 
Um, Solomon anticipated this very scenario and prayed in advance for God's mercy on the repentant. God has given promises uh, elsewhere in scripture to gather his people from where they have been scattered to the nations. And that may yet include, even though we don't know exactly who those people would be, a remnant of the faithful descendants of the 10 tribes. Um, okay, the second section of this is really the, uh, the most explicit. The narrator does not want us to miss this. This is not a chance. This is God's covenant justice. And so uh, starting in verse 7 of 17, chapter 17, going to verse 23, this, he interprets this for us. And there's a, the history of Israel in uh, basically three parts. And this occurred, verse seven, because the people of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and had feared other gods and walked in the customs of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel and in the customs that the kings of Israel had practiced. And the people of Israel did secretly against the Lord their God things that were not right. They built for themselves high places in all their towns from watchtower to fortified city. They set up for themselves pillars and ashram on every high hill and on under every green tree. And there they made offerings on all the high places as the nations did whom the Lord carried away before them. And they did wicked things, provoking the Lord to anger. And they served idols of which the Lord had said to them, you shall not do this. So God lovingly rescued and covenanted with Israel. God is their king. And notice here, like in verse seven, um, he rescued them from a bad king, Pharaoh, not to have no king, but he is their king. And even though uh, he's not given the title king in this section, he's described in ways ancient near readers would recognize that he is kingly. God did this because he loved them first. Moses tells us in Deuteronomy 7, 6 verse 11, and God gave them good land and good laws and their response should have been to love him loyally in return, Deuteronomy 6, 1 to 7, and serve him alone. But here's the second part. Israel wanted good things from God, but not an exclusive commitment. They want an open relationship. All right, Lord, we'll take that from you, but we're gonna keep our other options open. Um, despite his kindness to them and their commitment to him, um, or his and their previous commitment to him, because they said they would covenant with him. They were ungrateful and rebelled against the Lord, their king, which brings to our lens the problem, I think, um, into the problem of worship. And so what is worship? Uh, it's, it can be a churchy word that we think of meaning church services or specifically singing in church services. But Paul in Colossians 3.17 teaches us that everything we do can be worship. And worship, just looking at those root words, is really as the, uh, is proclaiming the worthship of something, saying something is worth and has value. Um, worship is adoring, reverencing, delighting in someone or something that we value. And so when we worship God, we behold God for who he is. Even the aspects of God's character that we actually are not comfortable with. But we see that and we say, yes, yes, Lord. Um, we proclaim the worship of our great God. He is good and loving. And when we, because of that, we then invest ourselves in his purposes, learning to love what he loves. And so here's the deal. Worship of God is dynamic. It shapes us. We become like what we worship. If you look uh, in verse 15 of chapter 17, um, they say, it says they, they, to the people who they were stubborn, they, the Lord reached out to them and uh, reminded them through his prophets and they were stubborn. They despised his statutes and his covenant that he made with their fathers and the warnings he gave them. They went after false idols and became false. They went after false idols, they became false. They worshiped wor worthless idols, NIV says, and became worthless. Um, what we worship, we become like. We become like what we worship. And so um, 
Our heart, worship is tricky. As someone once said, our hearts are constant idol factories. And so we can value and serve um, people and uh, ministries because they're, it's valuable to God. Uh, we can value people. He made them in, their, in his image and we're agreeing with him. Or uh, our hearts can twist that, even good things and good desires to value someone or something in a way that rivals our love for God. We can do it with jobs and exercise, with our family, with relationships, even uh, ministries. This is uh, idolatry. Idols usurp God as sovereign king in our lives. And so the Lord pursued his people, even although they stubbornly refused to listen, and they persisted in disordered loves. And um, it's a lie to think somehow that we're any different. <laughs> that somehow we can avoid having a master. If we worship or serve things other than the Lord, we become like them. And uh, if we serve the Lord, he molds us to be like him and his son, Jesus. And so we see how did the Lord respond? Verses um, 18 through 23, that therefore the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight. None was left but the tribe of Judah only. And the Lord, uh, let's see, the Lord rejected all the descendants of Israel and afflicted them and gave them in the hands of plunderers until he had cast them out of his sight. And so um, the epilogue in this section is then what did Assyria do with the land? And like I said, they, they deported Israel and they brought new people in. Um, the new people did not know God or fear him. And there's um, some interesting passage in, in the verses in there to read like how it seems like the Lord pursued those people. And, um, but they ended up with a syncretistic worship of uh, the Lord and other gods, some divided loyalties. And that I think provides a backdrop for us of the New Testament Samaritans why the Samaritans, those people were considered uh, different than the Jewish people who were, who lived in uh, the South and the North of uh, New Testament Israel. Okay. Principle for this section is that sin has consequences. Sin has consequences and stubborn sin has devastating consequences. And the story of this Northern Israel is sobering. Um, because it does indeed testify that rebelling against God in his world will not lead us to the life of flourishing or independence that we might hope for. God is patient and forgiving, um, long-suffering, but ultimately will not let us make ourselves and our world into whatever image that we want. And sin's lie is it won't hurt, no one will know, other people do it, but sin always takes us further than we wanna go and it never delivers, delivers on its promises. And I wonder, where does this story rub you wrong? Is there an aspect of God's revealed character that is offensive? where you say or attempted to say, loving God would not do this. The God I believe in would not do this. I wonder, have you had a roommate or a family member and thought about, um, I wish they were different. I wish they didn't leave their stuff out. I wish they didn't like use my toothpaste. Um, Does wishing make it so? If we wish God were different, does that make it so? I suggest to you it doesn't. Um, I encourage us to not dismiss what we don't like about God. If this indeed is an accurate reflection of God's character, the stakes are high. And uh, would you stay in this text and wrestle with it? Um, Keep coming, keep studying. Be willing to pray for God's help in knowing and accepting who he is. And I wonder, do you have an, an area where you are knowingly disobedient to the Lord? that you know God will forgive you but in Jesus, but you're just gonna go ahead in rebellion. Um, I encourage you, sin has consequences. Accept responsibility for your sin, confess it, turn from it, and move forward believing that God will equip you to walk without sin. We can be confident that God's spirit is at work when people recognize and take radical action to personal sin. That is God's generous grace. Uh, okay. Let's, let's move on. Um, 
Actually, let me just say this one. You do not have to be perfect to be loved of God or used by him. And we're, we'll see that in this next section. Um, Jesus is the perfect sacrifice for yours, sin, and mine. And once you trust in Jesus, uh, trust in his sacrifice on your behalf, you confess your sin to him. It is forgiven. It is gone. He is just and he won't punish you for that sin Uh, Not that there won't be earthly consequences, but spiritually it's gone and he paid the price. You can walk free of shame and bear it no more. Um, But, and we can also trust in that, that even though earthly consequences, some of them may may remain for sin that we do or foolish decisions, uh, those sins, those consequences will not define us, that God will miraculously use those to accomplish his purpose. Okay, God is pursuing his people and rewiring his hearts to love him. Okay, I knew I would get to the, I'm like, oh, these are such great chapters, but I was really wordy on that. So this is very, I'm gonna try to do this really quickly. Um, Chapter 18 to 20, we see that um, humble trust is proved by God's deliverance. We see King Hezekiah, this is his account um, within Kings, leads the people back to the Lord and largely trusts in him. And so we see really the opposite of the last section. Here, God delivers those who trust in him. And in this section, I suggest to you another reason to see God as, as a king in this character or in this, in this text is that Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, and the Lord are set in as rivals for Hezekiah's trust and and, um, investment. Okay, so we see here that we have in verse, starting in verse 18 or chapter 18, one to eight, we see Hezekiah is commended. He does right. He led a revival, toppling idols. The passages in, in Chronicles go deeper into this. And really Hezekiah is, is a huge star in, um, in Chronicles. And, um, in that, we see also he was uh, getting rid of idolatry in the land. And as a result, he also, in uh, verse 8, or sorry, verse 7, he rebelled against the king of Assyria and would not serve him. So there seems to be a tension. If you're faithful to the Lord, then um, you're going to rebel against the king of Assyria. Then we see in verses 19 through 16, Assyria is is in that attacking uh, Judah at Lachish and deporting Israel at that time, um, or maybe that was before that, sorry. Um, And this event, by the way, is recorded by Sennacherib. And so um, if you Google Sennacherib Lachish relief, you can see uh, evidence from the uh, Assyrian point of view, like this is what happened. And um, the Assyrians were very cruel. So I just warn you, there are some uh, hard things to see if you go look at that. Um, okay, uh, and says the things then we see in this, these verses nine to 16, um, that Hezekiah says, says things that uh, he should say to the Lord. Where is that? I can't find it. Um, he says, I have sinned. Hmm. I know it's in here. This is 14. Good. Thank you. Um, oh yeah. So, um, yeah, 14 and Hezekiah, king of Judah sent to the king of Assyria at Lachish saying, quote, I have done wrong. Withdraw from me. Whatever you impose on me, I will bear. And he takes, uh, out of the, uh, the house of the Lord, the Lord's, uh, the palace temple and takes valuables out of that and sends them to, uh, to Assyria. And um, <clears throat> uh, it does seem that uh, this is where Hezekiah was trusted in the Lord before in the verses. Um, God seems to reserve the right to be more generous with his condemnation. Um, by God's grace, if you've been redeemed in Christ, your defining characteristics will not be your failures. Um, so, and then we see in, uh, verse, uh, verses 17 to 37, the great King Sennacherib sends a taunt to Hezekiah that really insults the Lord. And there's full of rhetorical questions that are meant to discourage and manipulate. And so, um, verse 19, he says, on what are you basing this confidence of yours? Verse 20, on whom are you 
pending. Verse 22, your God won't help. In fact, your religious reforms angered him. Uh, Verse 23, internally you lack military strength. Um, In fact, in verse 25, kind of the icing on the cake, uh, the Lord himself told me, Sennacherib, to destroy this country. Um, And so he sends uh, also another message to the men in verses 29 to 30, uh, Hezekiah's men, saying, Hezekiah deceives you. He can't save you. The Lord can't save you. Instead, you should, in verses 31 and 32, make peace. Uh, come out. And he says all these lavish promises. You're going to eat and drink and comfort here. We're going to deport you. We're going to take you to another land that is equally bountiful and fruitful. And if you hear, if you know the echoes of what the Lord has said to his people in Deuteronomy um, and in the Pentateuch, like he's, it's deliberately ripping off, like setting in contrast, like the Lord's promises to his people and what Sennacherib is saying um, in in saying many of the same things, but in direct rivalry. And so in verse 33 and 34, he says, look at the evidence. No other God has been able to stop us and sort of ends on this uh, question, how then can the Lord deliver Jerusalem from my hand? And so then we have in uh, chapter 19, really, the uh, Hezekiah is by God's grace. He has it together. Um, he grieves and he goes to the house of the Lord and he lays out uh, the the taunt that Sennacherib brought to him and um, and in verse uh, fourteen and and he prayed in sorry in, in verse fifteen Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, quote, "O Lord, the God of Israel, enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God." You alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see, and hear the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to mock the living God. Truly, O Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste the nations and their lands and have cast their gods into the fire, for they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone, Therefore, they were destroyed. So now, O Lord, our God, save us, please, from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you, O Lord, are God alone. And we see then, uh, going immediately, verse 20, uh, the Lord hears and answers through Isaiah the prophet, because God honors and hears prayer of faith and trust. And so, uh, this is a great poetic response. Three quick things. One, uh, verses 21 and 22, uh, there's God's people character person, uh, personified as the virgin daughter of Zion, uh, of Jerusalem. Uh, they, he, she is trusting in the Lord's deliverance even before she sees it. And you and I need to do that too. We need to trust in the Lord's deliverance even before we see it. Um, Sennacherib's work was ordained by God, but it, he was accountable to him. And in verse, uh, in verse 34, it kind of sums it all up. Um, for I will defend this city, the I here is the Lord speaking. I will defend this city, meaning Jerusalem, to save it for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. And not only does he say he's going to do it, but then he goes out immediately and he, and he does it um, in a miraculous way. And so as a contrast, the Lord proves himself living and Hezekiah is saved where Sennacherib's God can't protect him even in his own temple house, that his sons rise up and and kill him in verse 37. So neither Sennacherib is a God nor Sennacherib's God is a God, but the Lord is a God um, and he is true. Okay, so uh, we we go to the... um, going on in verse uh, chapter 20, just two excerpts of Hezekiah testing once through sickness and once through prosperity. Um, a believer can never rest on today's spiritual victory. Um, our sanctification is not complete and you and I need our Lord in new and deeper ways. Um, sometimes prosperity can be a greater spiritual threat than adversity. Okay, principle for this section, just to wrap up, God trains his people to seek and expect his deliverance. God trains his people to seek and expect his deliverance. Um, If you're driving in an unfamiliar part of town or the country and you come to a stoplight and it's red, uh, 
what do you do? Obviously you stop, right? Um, But when's it gonna turn green? You don't know what kind of timer it's on. Um, So what do you do? Do you take a nap? No, you might uh, text a friend, you check your directions, make sure there's nothing in your teeth. Um, But at some level, you're gonna keep your eyes on that light. And how do you know it's gonna turn green? You don't, you've never been there before. Um, But you trust because you've seen the system work in a similar way in similar places. And so in the same way, God calls us to trust him, to watch him, to believe that he will keep his promises this time. You've never been in the situation you are now. How do you know the Lord will be faithful? Because that even more than a traffic light turn, you know, traffic lights get wonky sometimes. The Lord doesn't get wonky. Like he is always faithful to his character. And then we can believe that he will keep his promise this time. And that later, even though we don't know how long we're going to be watching and waiting for his deliverance, and it probably sometimes feels like forever, that we will be able to look back and see his faithfulness. Um, God trains his people to seek and expect his deliverance. So how is God training you to seek and expect his faithful deliverance? Um, Where in your life do you feel like you're stopped, waiting at a stoplight? Maybe it's with work or finances, a relationship, your singleness. Um, Maybe you've been treated unfairly. Maybe you feel abandoned or you are actively in crisis of uh, going through some deep trauma and have very dark thoughts The gospel tells us that God sees you. He knows you and he loves you. God is not withholding good from you or me. His plan is the best. You and I might disagree. We might not feel like his is the best plan, but the Bible tells us that God is loving and he sees and he knows where you are and he is working out all things for his glory and for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Your life is part of his plan, even small things, because he's a really big God. Um, So what are you doing while you're waiting? Are you checking your phone or distracting yourself, entertaining, or are you seeking to know him better, trying to be a blessing in the places where he's put you? Studying the Bible is one of the best places to be waiting on him. And have, so I'm super glad that you're here. Uh, have you asked him for deliverance? Um, that's the first step. And are you, um, you're learning to glue your eyes on him, like uh, even more than a stoplight. Um, and if so, uh, can you see a pattern of God's instruction to your life, teaching you to turn to him quicker and thanking him for his deliverance? Um, if you are a believer then will you pause to look at how God is already rewiring your heart to love him, to love him more, to value him more, to soften your heart, to hear conviction of sin, to have by his grace and by the work of Christ, a changed life that testifies to his, uh, his living and active work um, that he will begin, he will come finish the good work he has begun in you. Your destiny and mine if you are in Christ, if you've trusted in Christ as your savior, is to be someone who is like in the parking lot, the Tennessee Titans, and it is single digits. And we are having a blast. And it's like, okay, but it's like he has, he will have so rewired our hearts that we don't see the hard things. We see his glory and we value him. Um, Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your kindness to us, your patience, uh, that you are working to transform your people, to love you more and to trust you more. Lord, would you continue this good work in us uh, even tonight as we go to our discussions. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen.